Hello and welcome. I'm Marie Milo with NAMI Santa Clara County, and I'm here today with David Mineta, President and CEO of Momentum for Health. Under David's leadership, the nonprofit offers adults, adolescents, and families an array of comprehensive behavioral health services to promote healthier and independent living. Prior to David's appointment at, Monet, at Momentum, he served as a presidential appointment in the position of deputy director for demand reduction for the Office of National Drug Control Policy in Washington, DC. David served in this capacity for five years. When he accepted the position at Momentum in 2015, he was returning home to his roots. Before leaving DC, he worked for 14 years as deputy director of Asian American Recovery Services in the Bay Area. He has earned his master's in social work from San Jose State University and a bachelor's degree at the University of California, Berkeley. David, welcome and congratulations on being selected to receive our NAMI Santa Clara Award for 2020 Community, uh, excuse me, for our 2020 Community Merit Award. So congratulations on this honor. Well deserved, we all say. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, Maureen. I um, uh, am enormously humbled uh, by this recognition. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, the board. I want to thank everyone at NAMI uh, for this, uh, um, again, for this uh, award. Uh, it is, it caught me completely off, off guard, very surprised. Uh, I'm, I'm um, you know, again, I just feel stunned into, into humility um, uh, by this. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially under these circumstances during the pandemic. Uh, and I, I would like to just also, again, thank, thank NAMI, but I accept this uh, uh, award on behalf of um, all the staff at Momentum uh, who every day are working hard to maintain services for uh, you know, the community that needs it right now, uh, our community members who need it the most, and, uh, and to the individuals and our clients and the families. Again, um, I accept this on behalf of, uh, of all. Uh, and, um, you know, because everyone's doing the best they can during the pandemic. And uh, um, we've seen some just amazing um, uh, efforts by, uh, you know, um, our agency staff and, and clients and families. Uh, so again, on behalf of everyone and our board, I would like to thank NAMI for this amazing uh, recognition. Well, I know the board of directors were very excited to give that to you. And uh, I, I think it's, it's part of the, the reason is your passion and, and what drives you. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people might be curious to know what, what created such a passion in you towards this field of mental health? How, how did that come about? Yeah, um, again, thanks. I, you know, many of us have our own uh, connections and personal stories around uh, behavioral health issues, mental, mental illness, um, substance use disorders. And I think that, uh, you know, our family is, is really no different. And there was a time where, uh, you know, I was very concerned about a family member, uh, you know, growing when I was growing up. And, uh, I kept thinking, I wish there was somebody in school that could help uh, around these kinds of concerns and and um, uh, depression and being sad and and you know just not having joy in their in their you know in their world uh, due to some other other circumstances. And I started volunteering and at a local um, agency uh, in um, where we lived in in Virginia. And they kept saying, if you want to do this kind of work, you're going to need to go back to grad school, you know, and, uh, and I was working with a bunch of social workers and I'm like that I, I want to do what you do, man, that, that, that's a, that's great work. I'd love to do this. And so, you know, came back to San Jose State uh, for my master's in social work and have spent the last 30 years in the field and loving work. I love going to work. Uh, and it's such a privilege to be able to be a part of a great team, um, serving others. And 
you know, I wish that upon other folks, like find something you love, you know, do what you love, love what you do. And, and, and um, you know, it's been so rewarding. And I, I, I just love coming to work. And, and that, and that's amazing. I mean, you know, there's, there's such a need today more so than ever with the pandemic for people in your profession, whether it's from the doctor side or the clinical side or the therapist or psychologist, I, I mean, you're, you're just seeing it in the news all the time. So it's odd to say you're in the sweet spot of things, knowing how terrible life is today in some areas, but at the same time, um, it's so important, the work you do. Um, and, and when you came back to Momentum, um, I, I think that the, uh, what I had read was that the board had a, a strategic plan to, to strengthen its position in the community and, you know, recognize, be recognized for its leadership, uh, it, it, how effective it could be, how comprehensive the services could be. Um, and, and it sounded like that was sort of the mission when you came back, uh, part of it at least. Uh, was, how, how is that going? I mean, what's happened <laughs> with all Yeah, that? no, absolutely. And, 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 you know, again, this, um, you know, I feel like I, I joined a very strong, um, you know, healthcare provider in our community and a strong team, a long history of, uh, of services in the community. And, and it's been great to be able to join such an institution in the community and try to, you know, with, with uh, new team members and all is to, is to advance, um, you know, advance that cause. I mean, part of it, I think, is that is we feel like we are also a, um, you know, sort of representing behavioral health out in the community. And we don't want it to be stigmatized and for people fear it and you, you sort of push to the side. We're like any other healthcare provider, really, right? And uh, it's just that sometimes that there's a stigma attached to mental illness and substance disorders such that people don't want to talk about it. And as a result, people don't get help, the help they need that's available that's actually out there. And so Momentum is a part of a network of agencies. And again, I, I don't want to make this all about necessarily a Momentum. I love the agency. I love what we do. I love our team. But we are part of a network of other behavioral health agencies who have similar missions of, you know, we want, we want people to to be able to say, I'm experiencing some, you know, mental uh, health condition and I can receive help. And I'm now, you know, in recovery and, uh, you know, better for it. When people feel like they have to be quiet about it and, you know, that's when we don't get the help we need. Uh, and um, I think it's interesting that after 27 years in the field, um, my family, my own family, we, uh, we needed um, mental health services in my own family. Our, our daughter experienced uh, uh, at, at the time in high school some, you know, very acute depression and anxiety. And so for the first time in my, in, from my experience, uh, you know, we were accessing services ourselves. And I think that 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 experience has in, in, in some ways given me even renewed energy and commitment around the services of, that we provide at Momentum uh, and you know, ensuring that they are uh, um, client-centered and they're uh, trying to empower uh, the, the, the client and family. Uh, and that really that momentum could be a beacon of that message, that really that we are on point on that message. So, so David, is that one of the reasons why you've now uh, changed the name from momentum up for mental health to momentum for health now? Is that, was that yeah. what motivated it or how did that? I mean, you know, Marie, for, you know, really for decades, even with the agencies that merged into momentum in 1997, uh, you know, these are traditional mental health services, right? We were providing traditional mental health services. Uh, when I uh, came to Momentum, we wanted to broaden that and we've since added uh, addiction, uh, substance, substance use disorder services. And as a result, the Momentum for Mental Health was a little narrow, 
Mm -hmm. um, in addition, we have uh, a partnership with a federally qualified health center who are actually providing primary care on our sites, a couple sites as well. So it, it, it is much broader than, than just the mental health. And we were looking at 10 to 15 years down the road that you know, who knows what, what other things, you know, services we're providing, but that broader health message was really important uh, to be able to convey. And, and have you integrated that into, um, for example, you know, I, we've talked about that I had a, my family had experience over at La Salva. Has that been um, integrated into that organization too? Or is the addiction treatment sort of a, an add-on service? How, how is that all falling into place? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really is, um, on the public side, it really is a vestige of their sort of bifurcation of, uh, uh, of funding, is that mm -hmm. the funding for the services have been separate, and, you know, therefore, it's been hard to integrate them. Uh, at certain programs, LSG being one, is that is that you know there there is some actually overlap as well anyway our residential public residential services they've been doing you know working with folks who have active addictions and or and or have a history or are in recovery um, for years right it's right. just in some programs that that you couldn't actually um, you had to refer to you know another program. Um, we'd like actually for people to, to receive their services all in-house, mm -hmm. as you said, sort of in an integrated way. Don't divide up their different uh, health conditions and actually have them, you know, especially if they're behavioral health, if they're all under the behavioral health right. rubric. Well, um, and, and so many of those who do struggle with serious mental illness have a dual diagnosis because they're using drugs to self-medicate. Uh, exactly. And not because they wanted to, just because they didn't know how to solve their problem. That became a, a, another door for them, right or wrong. So Exactly. It, and a lot of yeah. times it's very hard to talk about, right? It's like, yeah. oh, I let me compartmentalize this part. I don't want to tell you this. And it's like, no, it's 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 actually okay, right? Yeah, you, right. you know, we can we can talk about all of that uh, in the same in the same program or the same agency, right? That right. we could be that for at least for that, then at least we can we can keep it within in house, let's say. Right, right. Exactly. Otherwise, people are going yeah. all over town and all right. over the county for you know here go here go there. Right, right. Uh, and and you know again, we can do better as a system to integrate and to to not compartmentalize uh, people's behavioral health. So so the, you know I I would think that one of the problems with being able to do that clearly is funding <laughs> and <laughs> to be able to create a one-stop shop where somebody can have all their services in one location and uh, you know not have to go from you know San Mateo to Santa Clara or to wherever they have to go just to accomplish what their, their, their needs um, is that are there government holdups are there um, uh, is it a matter of just the community you know, contributing to help? I mean, how, how do we get there? Because that, that's a very difficult, um, so, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, to accomplish what, what, what needs to be done, what's logically needs to be done. Yes. And, you know, fortunately and, un, and unfortunately in this, uh, in your question is, um, you know, a lot of really, really smart, capable people have been trying to figure this out for some years. And I've been in the field, as I said before, I've been in the field for 30 years. And we've been talking about integrated behavioral health services, you know, at least the entire time I've been in the field. And so if it was that simple, we would have actually figured it out. Uh, but it is, it remains to be very difficult. Part of it, I think, is, as I said earlier, is because of that bifurcated funding, uh, at mm -hmm. least on the public side. Uh, and, and, the other piece is that uh, on the substance use disorder side, I would almost say that there's additional stigma because uh, folks often are, um, it's a criminal act uh, mm -hmm. to um, um, possess uh, controlled substances, uh, to behave in certain ways. Uh, um, so oftentimes it comes with a criminal arrest record and I've worked with families in the past uh, in different communities, particularly in 
in, um, I can think of one uh, Asian family where the parents said, I'd rather have my kid, uh, you know, be, uh, be crazy, um, you know, in the pejorative, I mean, not in, in the sort of descriptive of mm-hmm. mental illness, rather than, than be an addict, because then they'd be a criminal. Mm-hmm. And it's those kinds of things that, again, separate even mental illness and a substance disorder, and, and then further drive those systems apart. Right. Uh, so as you well, said earlier, yeah. a lot of people have co-occurring disorders, at least right. momentum, it's you know, over 30, 35%, right? But again, I think it's even higher than that normally is, and again, it's because sometimes people just would rather not um, have these two stigmatized conditions uh, announce it, you know, sort of to the world. Right, right. So you have all these layers that you have to contend with to to somehow- Funding, you know, federal funding, state, you know, billing, um, you know, county. So you have the the, 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 the financial structure on the public side, but again, and then the, their, their sort of cultural and, um, uh, you know, stigmas and, and further. And then in specific communities, then it gets even more complex if you go into certain uh, underserved, historically underserved communities in, in behavioral health, you know, on behavioral health issues. Right. right. So, there is, it's again, if it was, if it, if it was super simple, you know, we, we would have figured this out. We have some of the best minds in the world working on this and it still is a pernicious problem. But, but I think from what I read, at least in one of, one of the newsletter columns you had, it sounds like you're, it's important to you to have collaboration and that's critical in momentum, success in its growth and, and in helping everybody on a more holistic basis. Um, and I, I think since you've been there, you've really started to partner with a lot of different nonprofits, not, you know, the, the, the sense of uh, competitiveness is not, is not there for you. Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be. We're, we're essentially in one system. We're mm-hmm. different providers, different agencies with sort of a single goal, all of us. Right. right. And at one point, you know, we see this a lot in, in behavioral health that, you know, talking to someone with a acute mental, uh, mental health condition, we may be able to say it. And then, and then the conditions are such that that person may choose to go somewhere else and they're going to hear. And when they do, they may actually hear the same message better. It's just timing, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's a bunch of different conditions. It's up to the system to be able to consistently be able to actually provide that level of care when someone needs it, mm-hmm. when someone needs it, right? right and right. when they're, they're, they're of a position to be somewhat you know, additionally motivated and all. So we are in that system. You know, we are a member and a part of that system. Um, we, aren't, we don't have to be the end all be all, but we as, a, as an agency, our stance is that we just need to come to work every day knowing that. And that's what my sense is during the pandemic that we've watched our staff um, really get after that, to be able to stay open for folks. You know, it turns out that not everybody can, uh, um, uh, can uh, access their services virtually, right? That right. We still have to have in-person services, or residential, obviously. Right. But even on the outpatient side, you know, if you don't have a ready-made access to internet or a phone or working phone or whatever, Sometimes people, that's their only kind is, is to come in. Now, that's not just us, that's other providers as well. We are, again, in that system. And, um, you know, with the hospitals, with the primary care, right? Many, many of our clients have two or more health conditions, uh, you know, asthma and a mental illness. Uh, and so we always have to be working with the primary care as well to coordinate those services. Again, better outcomes when we coordinate, and mm-hmm. that's what we're all after, right? Helping people and, and better outcomes. So, um, you know, this is just something that it's just part and parcel of now, you know, healthcare, behavioral healthcare in 2020, 2021. Um, and uh and and on so i mean i think that is just it's part and parcel 
So, and perhaps it's one of the better things that has come out of the pandemic is the need for more collaboration, um, recognition of those that have been underserved, who have been hit the hardest by the pandemic itself. I mean, you worked in those communities, so you must have had grave concerns for watching, you know, th those communities struggling through. Um, how did how did you get the message out, or how to say, hey, we're here, we can help you? Yep. Um, that that you know that that's one of the problems NAMI has too. How do you get the word out? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and again, I mean, Nami does does excellent work on that and how to get the word out, and uh, you know, and, and it's great to be in partnership with uh, you know with Nami on trying to do that. One of the things that we've said is um, that I I try to message uh, uh, when we're out talking out in the community is that whatever conditions there were pre COVID pre pandemic are exaggerated uh, now during the pandemic. So if, if communities were historically sort of underserved or not connected in behavioral health or to services, that has probably only gotten worse now. Uh, and so it's tough to think about, but we do have to redouble those efforts and make sure that we are getting um, the messages out to particularly um, those, uh, you know, uh, communities that have been have been difficult for them to access these services, um, and and I think our use of data is really important here. And this is something we've been working on with, actually, uh, you know, some some board members from NAMI and and you know leaders in the community around that data, you know, our our use of data or even access to data. Uh, and it turns out that on, on, you know, one of the worries nationally has been the pandemic is going to, is we're going to see an increase in, um, suicide attempts, um, 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 deaths by suicide. And, you know, sadly, a lot of times we don't know that information, uh, have the up-to-date information on that. And, um, and with, uh, you know, efforts of, uh, someone like um, uh, Vic or Jackie, and who we are so fortunate in our county to have a NAMI board member uh, co-chair be such a force on trying to prevent uh, any any suicide for any um, age level, any community, any person in the community. And um, so, in that example on the on the data, the data locally will then go up to the state. And then it won't come back to us uh, for months, maybe even a year or more. So it's irrelevant by the time you get it. <laughs> yeah, we would never even know if the numbers, yeah. the numbers yeah. it would be anecdotal. It's like, we need to know those numbers right now. And Vic has been working on that, uh, you know, tirelessly with folks in the county, with folks in the state. Um, but it's those kinds of efforts that I think are, are so key right now for us. And, um, and you have young adult early intervention programs at Momentum. Um, has the, the issue of suicide come to your doorstep uh, or somehow been part of these early intervention programs? Yes. I mean, it, and, and it is a constant worry for, you know, providers who are working with, with young folks um, and around suicide attempts. But particularly and in, in so much more of an exaggerated way in the pandemic. And because of that, they aren't in person in school uh, where you could actually identify and then be able to try to get services to. Now they're remote and hard yeah, to see. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are so many, again, um, sort of exacerbation, um, exaggeration of, of existing, you know, uh, worries and concerns. And now in the pandemic, wow. The other issue though, is that going forward is that our behavioral health issues are gonna be with us for a very long time. Uh, that's That's been the experience in past um, uh, more environmental crises, natural, um, you know, earthquakes, uh, fires and all. This one is public health crisis. This is going to be, we feel like this is going to be with us for a while. So again, 
you know, we're playing, we have to play a long game, sort of the marathon, but we're running like a sprint right now, which is right. very, very difficult. Right. So you'll, you'll have to sit back and strategize on how you take it forward. I mean, people are not, you know, people can lose housing. I mean, housing is a huge issue here, not to mention food insecurity um, yep. and people who have never before experienced any sort of really severe mental health. I mean, I, the only good thing about this um, for the situation is the awareness that all of a sudden people are talking about it, but yeah. it's unfortunate how, the, how it got to this point. Yeah, yeah, I think many of us knew that there was an epidemic out there all along. It's just that it wasn't front and center until now. Yeah, you know, I saw, I, I saw a while back, I saw a report that um, I think in the city and county up in San Francisco that there had been a report that um, overdose deaths had actually eclipsed uh, uh, COVID deaths. I saw that too, fentanyl overdoses. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, that is uh, connected to an opioid epidemic that has been raging for, for years. Right. Right. And also in the Bay Area, though, that the, you know, one of the one of the drugs of, um, you know, concern for us has always been methamphetamines. And yet and then in addition to that, alcohol and tobacco still kill more people. Than, right. So, again, these are these are um, uh, a pandemic, you know, over all these other um, behavioral health concerns. So to your point earlier though, Maurice, is that, you know, again, that in the midst of the storm is that people pulling together uh, and working across silos, that's the other piece is that working across silos right. is so important right now. Um, Santa Clara County had launched a COVID ambassadors program uh, uh, back in uh, December and you know had wanted 500 to 1,000 people become ambassadors to be able to have the information to take out to our, our, um, our neighbors and our, our family and to tell them really sort of the important lessons. Um, but one of the things was that to make sure that we talk about behavioral health and about food insecurity and other, and you know, housing and other specific right. drivers. Right. Uh, again, so to your point, yeah, working across silos right now, more important than ever. So, so some of the, the, the looking forward kind of strategies, you almost have to amp up at a level you never maybe thought you could before. I mean, not that anything was great before, but you know, as, as we've discussed, um, there's a lot of county programs uh, for people. Um, they have to find them, they have to, but they're there. Um, for those who still are fortunate enough to be employed, who might have similar problems, um, that's not such a, there's not such great opportunity out there because private insurance and public insurance uh, and public health, they're very, they're very counterintuitive in the way they operate in our, in, at least in California. I don't know if that's true everywhere else. <laughs> Yeah, I unfortunately I think I think so. You know, after uh, spending some time in Washington D.C. working the federal government, uh, particularly working on trying to make sure that um, that behavioral health benefits, uh, particularly the substance disorder benefits, you know, are covered by our um, by health insurance. Uh, you know, it is a very 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 uh, complex and uh, and difficult discussion actually mm -hmm. you know so this whole point of you know I think I just want to underscore your point of we have to do things that we've been trying to do for a very long time um, but we have to do them both broader and deeper right now than we ever have had to do before right uh, and um, you know that is uh, a challenge I know that is is you know difficult. It has been enormously difficult, stressful, um, but hopefully with the vaccines, you know, and and you know more widespread distribution of the vaccine, that that that'll give us the breather that we need to be able to hit those new levels of right of right. Um, service and integration and all. I mean, I think the 
you know, I think, I, I hope that the goodwill of folks, because, you know, we're all really stressed out. Mm -hmm. We're all super stressed. We're so tired. You know, we've been at this for a long time. We've seen, um, uh, it's been difficult because you, you, you know, there, there's a lot of bad news, right? right. Um, and yet in the midst of all that, you know, we have to stay together. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, is, is, and it's difficult communicating when you're stressed out and tired, not always the easiest task. In the best of times. <laughs> In the best of times, right? Right? And, and um, you know, we were just coming through, you know, really a growth in um, services and in the behavioral health system, at least, uh, you, you know, during good times. And now, wow. Um, so again, I just go back to, and I just thank our, uh, our staff and what I hear from the other behavioral health agencies, their staff, for maintaining this system so that people who need the who need the care are able to get the care. Um, that is, it, it's been phenomenal. I think when we look back on this, that'll be one of the most amazing things, achievements that we've all been able to be a part of. And, and services yeah. going. Well, and, and you know, sometimes uh, they always say during some of the, the darkest times, the most difficult times, some great innovation some great new ideas are are from our are, are when come to the top and and I, I think that's going to happen during what's going on now too. Um, just the vaccines themselves is like a, a remarkable accomplishment and I'm not sure that overall the country understands that. I mean it took 25 years to come up with a polio vaccine and we did 11 months we came up with a COVID vaccine I and two two different pharmaceuticals accomplish that I mean that, that's unbelievable. So hopefully those are all indications of maybe a broader view and how we need to treat people across the board, behavioral health wise, physical, whatever the needs might be. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine what your staff is going through. Uh, it, it must be every day, you know, you walk in and there's probably another, another worry or concern that you have to address there. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, and I, I appreciate that what you just said, Maureen, though, is that, you know, it goes back to the staff, right? And, uh, you know, who are, who are daily providing care for folks. Uh, and, you know, it's been our, our goal and, and hope is that we were, you know, one, protecting um, the clients, we're protecting the staff, and we're keeping services going. So I'm, I'm going to turn the things on you because I know you, you're, you're a real team player and you want to talk about everybody at Momentum, but I want to ask something about you <laughs> and I want to know, and it, this is a big question here, so I'm getting you ready for it. I want to know after everything, after, you know, one point in your life and you say, okay, I, I'm going to, I'm going to pull back now and I'm, I'm going to retire, which I don't really see you doing for a long time. <laughs> what? What do you think, what would you like your legacy to be? <laughs> hmm. Well, you know, I, I uh, wow, that, that's, that's, yeah, that's a big thing. I one. warned you it was a big question. Yeah, you, got, you got me on this one. <laughs> I mean, I think one, the first, I think, you know, is with so many others, and it starts with uh, sort of my family um, that, uh, you know, after, you know, I want to be, one, I want to be there for my family. Uh, and, um, you know, particularly after the, the, um, the issues that we had around behavioral health and, and issues uh, that my daughter's worked so, um, you know, she's worked her recovery so well. Um, um, so that's, you know, obviously for a lot of folks, that, that's where it starts and begins. But, mm -hmm. m you know, part of my thing is that for work and for home, mine sort of doesn't separate um, because we have, um, we deal with our behavioral, you know, mental health issues at home and, and all and, and um, you know, and then go to work. Mine sort of 24-7, 365. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, part of it is, is uh, you know, that, that, you know, I could have been a part of a, a larger effort uh, to help folks around behavioral health. Uh, and that, you know, wherever it was that people will say, you know, I, um, I know Dave tried 
every day. You know, he was trying every day uh, uh, to be part of a larger network and team of helping people around behavioral health. Um, and, and also for those who oftentimes go most unnoticed. Um, and, um, um, you know, I, I, I feel like in, in this, in, in, at work, I feel like, you know, the hardest thing that, or the, the thing that leads to burnout the most is feeling alone. And when you feel like you're part of a larger effort, a bigger team, agency, you know, community effort, you don't feel so alone. And it, it helps you stay in and helps you stay in 30 years and keeps you coming back every day and, and, and happy and eager to be there. Uh, and, you know, I would hope that that's sort of the legacy that I could leave is that um, he liked coming to work every day and uh, loved being part of a bigger team that, were, that was able to help lots of folks. Okay, so on that note, I'm going to thank you for spending time with us today and explaining about yourself and momentum and uh, certainly well deserving of the award that you've received. And uh, we thank you so much for your time and collaborating with NAMI. And I want to make sure you take care of yourself, your family, and you stay healthy, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maureen. And again, uh, to the NAMI board and uh, to NAMI staff and, and everyone at NAMI, thank you very much for this, this wonderful recognition. I'm, I'm f absolutely floored. Um, well, you're very well deserved and, and we look forward to honoring you with it. So take care. Thanks, Marie. Okay, okay. you too. Okay, right. stay safe. You too. Bye. Bye.